Stalin, Section, The Question of Cosmopolitanism. The Doctor's Plot itself, widely used to confirm Stalin's anti-Semitism, eventually demonstrates the opposite. After everything, and until the very end, he trusted Jews with taking care of his health. Moreover, only some of the doctors accused are Jews, and the whole plot as a whole is classified by Soviet leaders and the press as, quote, more capitalist and imperialist than Zionist, end quote. Was the suspicion caused just by paranoia? One detail to consider, quote, The CIA became more friendly in relation to the Jewish state, starting from the moment in which it gained the use of Israeli intelligence sources in Eastern Europe and in the USSR. For example, Mossad agents were the first abroad to receive the complete text of Khrushchev's secret speech on Stalin's crimes and passed it on to the American intelligence services. End quote. It's necessary to remember that the age of suspicion, as it was correctly defined, encourages the witch hunts in both blocks, in obviously different ways. Furthermore, it's not a secret to anyone that American intelligence services were committed to the physical elimination of Stalin, as well as Castro, Lumumba, and other, quote, mad dogs. How to reach the undisputed leader of the international communist movement, if not by making use of the individuals close to him, and susceptible of being recruited by Western intelligence services in the wake of a recent conflict, like the one unleashed following the foundation of the Jewish state and the program of Jewish immigration pursued by it. At the time when the plot was revealed, quote, at least one leading Western diplomat present in Moscow, the British diplomat Sir A. Joe Gascon, had thought the Kremlin doctors were really guilty of political treason. End quote. Furthermore, the suspicion towards doctors appears to be a recurring theme in Russian history. An Israeli historian of Russian origin attributed the death of Tsar Alexander III to the German doctors who had treated him. It must be added that a book recently published in the United States formulates a theory that it was medical treatment that caused the death of Zhdanov. Must we then conclude that Stalin's concerns were baseless? Without presenting any proof, and even recognizing that there's no documents that supports their theory, the authors of the book are quick to clarify that it wasn't the enemies of the Soviet Union who manipulated the doctors, but the dictator in the Kremlin himself. Moreover, apart from a radiologist, None of the doctors who treated Zidanov were Jewish. Now, it's clear. We are in the field of mythology, and a mythology with an unsettling subtext. It's permissible to be suspicious of doctors just for being Germans, or Gentile Russians. Let's return, then, to the field of historical research. It must be kept in mind that Stalin himself could have been the one who suspended the investigation aware, perhaps, of the mistake he had made. Lacking other arguments, they cite Stalin's condemnation of, quote, cosmopolitanism, to cling to the theory of his anti-Semitism. Who would be the cosmopolitans if not the Jews? In reality, the accusation of cosmopolitanism is inserted in the context of a sharp debate by both sides. Those that first decided to commit to the construction of socialism in the country born out of the October Revolution of 1917, renouncing the millenarian expectations of the arrival or the exporting of the revolution throughout the world, are accused of, quote, national pettiness and being, quote, nationally confined, as well as being provincial. While Stalin is the, quote, small provincial man with, quote, peasant rudeness, Molotov doesn't come out any better in Trotsky's opinion, as, quote, he hadn't visited any foreign country and didn't know any foreign language, end quote. Both of them have the same defect of remaining stubbornly attached, in a provincial and obscurantist way, to the, quote, reactionary role of the nation-state, 
end quote. Those who are attacked in this way respond by defining their accusers as abstract cosmopolitans, incapable of building a truly new social order. To read the condemnation of cosmopolitanism in anti-Semitic terms means neglecting a problem that is at the center of all the great revolutions driven by a universalist charge. Rejecting the theory of exporting the revolution, cherished by the supporters of the, quote, Republic One and Universal, or more precisely the, quote, Universal Conflagration, Robespierre clarifies that the New France would not contribute to the cause of the revolution by behaving like the, quote, capital of the world, from which would be sent armed missionaries for the conversion and the conquest of the world. No, what puts the old regime in Europe in crisis won't be the, quote, exploits of war, but the wisdom of our laws, end quote. In other words, revolutionary authority will play a real internationalist role to the degree that it knows how to complete its national task of building a new order in France. It's a problem to which German idealism gave great consideration. In Kant's opinion, writing in 1793-94, to and outlining in some form a philosophical and historical evaluation of the French Revolution, while patriotism runs the risk of slipping into exclusivism and losing sight of universalism, abstract love for men, quote, loses its balance due to its excessively broad universalism. It's then a question of reconciling world patriotism with local patriotism, or with love for the homeland, that which is authentically universalist, quote, in its attachment to its own country, must be inclined to promoting the well-being of the entire world, end quote. It's a line of thought later developed by Hegel, after having celebrated as a great historic conquest the formulation of the concept of the universal man, possessor of rights, quote, as a man, as a Jew, Catholic, Protestant, German, Italian, etc. The philosophy of right adds that it must not lead to cosmopolitanism and indifference or opposition with respect to the concrete state of life in the country in which one is a citizen. Quote, the universal love for men risks becoming an empty universality, and devoid of content. The individual contributes to the universal first by concretely engaging the specific circle, the family, the society, the nation, in which he lives. Otherwise, the acclaimed universal love for men is at best a declaration of noble intentions. At worst, it's a way of evading the field of concrete responsibilities. It's a problem that, with its even more emphatic universalism, the October Revolution inherits in a more acute form from the French Revolution. Well before Stalin, Herzen, while exiled in Paris, shows great distrust and criticism toward a cosmopolitanism that doesn't recognize the idea of the nation and national responsibility. It's a controversy that goes beyond the borders of the Soviet Union. In rejecting the accusations of nationalism made against the CPSU majority, and primarily against Stalin, Gramsci takes a clear position against a so-called internationalism that's in reality similar to a vague cosmopolitanism. The principal target here is Trotsky, criticized as cosmopolitan for being, quote, superficially national and therefore incapable of, quote, cleansing internationalism of every vague and purely ideological, in its negative sense, element, end quote. And he's opposed to Stalin and Lenin especially, who embody a mature internationalism precisely by proving to be profoundly national at the same time. In the USSR, the criticism of cosmopolitanism becomes sharper to the degree that the threat represented by fascism and Nazism worsens. 
We know the passionate appeal, two years before Hitler's rise to power, directed by Dimitrov to revolutionaries for them to reject, quote, national nihilism. Cosmopolitanism is an internationalism that leads to national nihilism. We also saw Stalin, on the eve of Operation Barbarossa, stress that, contrary to a cosmopolitanism, incapable of assuming its national responsibilities, internationalism must know how to be combined with patriotism. That means that, far from being synonymous with anti-Semitism, the criticism of cosmopolitanism is an essential element in the struggle against Nazi fascism and anti-Semitism. That critique becomes urgent again with the start of the Cold War, when a new terrible threat loomed over the USSR. Stronger yet is the critique of cosmopolitanism when the country immersed in revolution is engaged in a struggle for national survival. In China, Sun Yat-sen writes, quote, The nations that make use of imperialism to conquer other peoples, and thereby try to strengthen their position as masters of the world, are in support of cosmopolitanism. And they try by all means to discredit patriotism as something petty and anti-liberal, end quote. Mao aligns himself with that view. According to him, internationalism doesn't in any way make patriotism obsolete. Quote, the universal truths of Marxism must be integrated with the concrete conditions of different countries, with the unity between internationalism and patriotism. End quote. In the USSR, did Jews make up the majority of cosmopolitans, and therefore anti cosmopolitanism? is only a camouflaged form of anti-Semitism? It's worthwhile to observe that, in elaborating his polemic against cosmopolitanism, Sun Yat-sen encourages the Chinese people to take the Jews as their example, because, despite millennia of oppression and exile, they never lost their sense of identity, and therefore of the obligation of reciprocal solidarity. But let's focus on the Soviet Union. The Jewish presence is numerous within the ranks of the CPSU majority. And among the first to throw the accusation of cosmopolitanism at the leader of the opposition is the German writer of Jewish origin, Feuchtwanger, who we have previously cited, quote, Trotsky was never a Russian patriot. His only concern was the world revolution, end quote. Moreover, to use the hermeneutics found in the accusations targeting Stalin, not even Trotsky could escape the accusation of anti-Semitism. In developing his analysis of pre-revolutionary Russia, he highlights how the market aristocracy had, quote, transformed the Tsar's government into its financial vassal, which guaranteed usurious profits, end quote. It must be added that, quote, the dominion of the market is represented by Rothschild and Mendelssohn, in fact, by the Mendelssohn International, that's to say, by individuals committed to respecting the laws of Moses to the same extent as those of the markets. End quote. As one can see, in this case, the reference to the Jewish world is explicit. Must we then conclude that the polemic against the, quote, market aristocracy is in fact aimed at Jews as such? to the point that we find ourselves before the umpteenth manifestation of anti-Semitism? Such an argument would be absurd, not only for Trotsky's Jewish origins. More significant is the fact that, in the same text, he dedicates pages to the powerful description of the, quote, bestial bacchanal, of blood spilled by the anti-Semitic gangs, tolerated and encouraged by the authorities and by, quote, Nikolaus Romanov the Augustinian protector of the pogromists, which fortunately faced the courageous and determined opposition of the revolutionary and socialist movement. But no less resolute in condemning that anti-Semitic, quote, cannibalism is Stalin. End of section. <laughs>